This is not your red panda. Did you know that in the 19th century, brave Zulu warriors could still achieve victory against the heavily armed British army? How did they manage to overcome the significant gap between melee weapons and firearms? Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Red Panda, and in the following video, I will explore the answers to these questions with you. In the previous episode on the Battle of Palakeo, I mentioned a group of African warriors. Armed with weapons inferior to those of the Qing dynasty and dressed in even poorer gear, they managed to achieve victories against the British that the Qing could hardly imagine. Without further ado, let us travel back to 1879 and see how the Zulu people managed to defeat the British. The Zulu are an African ethnic group living in South Africa. The Zulu nation was formally established around 1709, initially as a small tribe. Under the leadership of Shaka Zulu, who is often hailed as the Napoleon of Africa, the Zulu began to rise. Through numerous expansions, they eventually became a kingdom. The Causes of the Anglo-Zulu War As for why Britain went to war with the Zulu, the reasons are quite straightforward and rooted in history. In the 1860s, South Africa's diamond mining industry developed rapidly. With the discovery of the Kimberley Diamond Mines in the Cape Colony, a large number of British immigrants flocked to South Africa. In 1877, Britain annexed the Boer-ruled Transvaal Republic, bringing it under British colonial rule and putting it in direct contact with the Zulu Kingdom. Driven by their interests in December 1878, the British issued an ultimatum to the Zulu under various pretexts, demanding that they pay a fine of 600 cattle, disband their army, and allow British agents to reside in Zululand to supervise the Zulu king and their council. These terms essentially amounted to Britain using force to pressure the Zulu into surrendering and becoming a British dependency. Accepting these conditions would mean the loss of autonomy, which the Zulu naturally refused. In January 1879, British High Commissioner in South Africa, Lieutenant General Lord Chelmsford, led a mixed force of British regular troops, Boer soldiers and African natives, about 17,000 strong, on a grand offensive against the Zulu Kingdom, thus sparking the Anglo-Zulu War. The Shocking Battle of Isandlwana Lord Chelmsford ordered his troops to advance from three directions, intending to encircle and capture the Zulu capital, Ulundi. On January 21st, he personally led 5,000 men from the central column and camped on the plains below Isanlwana Hill. The Zulu, however, were not idle. 20,000 Zulu warriors swiftly and stealthily approached the area beneath Isanlwana Hill. The British force led by Lord Chelmsford had noticed unusual activity around their camp but their arrogance and underestimation of the Zulu prevented them from believing that 20,000 Zulu warriors could quietly reach the battlefield and lie in wait around their camp. A storm and the rugged terrain had already severely affected the morale of the British troops, so Lord Chelmsford was eager to engage the main Zulu force in a decisive battle. On the morning of January 22nd, Lord Chelmsford dispatched a small contingent to search for the main Zulu force while the majority of his troops remained resting on the slopes of Isanlwana Hill. The Zulu, observing the movements of the British, sent a small detachment to lure the British search party further away, causing the British advance party to mistakenly believe they had found the main Zulu force. Upon hearing the news that the British advance party had encountered the main Zulu force, Lord Chelmsford, without much consideration, immediately led reinforcements to their aid leaving only 600 British troops and 300 natal mounted police to guard the camp. Inside the camp, there were approximately 900 native soldiers and logistical personnel, along with a significant amount of supplies. Around 9 a.m., Lord Chelmsford, en route to the reinforcement, received reports of Zulus spotted around the camp. By this time, he and his troops were about 12 miles away from the camp. Stubbornly believing that he was pursuing the main Zulu force and that the Zulus attacking the camp were just small bands, Lord Chelmsford thought the British troops stationed at the camp could easily handle them, so he did not return promptly to defend it. Had Lord Chelmsford been familiar with the 36 stratagems, he would have understood the concept of luring the tiger down the mountain. The defenders of the camp also made a fatal mistake. Due to their contempt for the Zulus and the relatively hard soil, the British did not dig trenches or fortifications, 
which could have effectively slowed down the Zulu warriors' advance. Additionally, they failed to arrange the wagons into a circular defensive formation and did not retreat behind the wagon barricades in time. In essence, the British response can be summarized in two words, contempt and underestimation. On one side stood the mighty British Empire, fueled by the Second Industrial Revolution, armed with state-of-the-art Martini Henry rifles, while on the other side were just a group of African natives armed with the most common cold weapons. Spears, short stabbing spears, and shields. Speaking of which, it's important to note that firearms were also used by the Zulu forces. King Sechueo even equipped his troops with outdated firearms and weapons. The limited use of firearms by the Zulus during the war against the British can be attributed to two main reasons. First, the British had agreed in 1852 with the Boers not to sell firearms to Africans in Southern Africa anymore. Second, the martially inclined Zulus believed that firearms were for the weak and could only be used defensively. True men should fight with real weapons. Therefore, while firearms were present among the Zulus, they were mostly used as spears after firing a shot, with the gun being thrown like a spear, and then the warriors engaging in close combat with shields and short stabbing spears. Returning to the main point, at noon, the main Zulu force of 20,000 men launched an attack on the 1,800 British soldiers. They employed the traditional Zulu battle formation, known as the Buffalo Horns Formation, created by King Shaka. Young warriors formed the two wings, resembling the horns of a buffalo, while older warriors were positioned in the center, representing the head and chest of the buffalo. The head was responsible for breaking through the enemy's center, while the chest acted as a reserve force and provided overall command. During the engagement, the head of the buffalo formation charged in a dense formation to engage the enemy directly. Meanwhile, the wings encircled the enemy's flanks and rear. What followed was a scene unprecedented for the British troops. Waves of Zulu warriors wielding shields and long spears, roaring like the sea, surged towards them. Indeed, the British forces were not to be underestimated, and they quickly regained their composure from the initial chaos. Under the guidance of their officers, they conducted several precise volleys of fire. The Zulu warriors at the forefront fell under the relentless British gunfire, resulting in heavy casualties for the Zulu army. The ground in front of the defenses was littered with bodies. The battle intensified, but the British encountered a deadly problem. They were running out of ammunition. Due to the earlier intelligence error, the defending troops stationed at the camp believed they were facing only a small contingent of Zulu forces. Therefore, they boldly advanced a considerable distance. By the time they fully understood the situation on the battlefield, it was too late to retreat back to the camp. This led to their supply lines being stretched too thin, exacerbating the ammunition shortage. Shockingly, there was no organized effort by the British to transport ammunition effectively. Furthermore, the ammunition crates were tightly sealed with iron bands and screws, making it difficult to quickly access them, even if they were brought to the front line. Additionally, some Martini Henry rifles became overheated due to excessive firing rendering them unable to shoot. The firepower of the British significantly weakened as a result. Seizing the opportunity, the Zulu forces rallied once more, advancing step by step until they were within spear-throwing range. Amidst the deafening shouts of the Zulu warriors, a barrage of spears rained down on the British. The native African soldiers among the British ranks were the first to flee, causing the British line to collapse. The Zulus surged forward like a flood. The British ultimately resorted to hand-to-hand -hand combat with bayonets against the Zulus, but with the vast numerical disparity, the British were eventually overwhelmed and killed. In less than three hours, a military force equipped with top-tier weaponry was dealt a severe blow by a primitive tribe. For the British, this was undoubtedly a shameful chapter in their colonial history. Of course, in terms of casualties, the Zulus suffered even greater losses. Nearly all of the 1,800 British troops left at the camp perished, while close to 4,000 Zulus fell to British gunfire. Despite the heavy toll paid by the Zulus, they emerged victorious in this battle. Moreover, compared to the Battle of Palakeo, where the Qing forces only killed five soldiers of the Anglo-French coalition, the Zulus could be considered triumphant. So why did the Zulus win? Their courage and fearlessness were certainly factors, 
but the arrogance and underestimation of the British were equally important in leading to their defeat. If the British had constructed proper defensive fortifications, fought from trenches instead of on the plain against the Zulus, and if their supply lines were not so distant, the British might have had a better chance of holding their ground. Some may find this speculative, given the numerical odds of 20,000 versus 1,800, but the subsequent battle vividly demonstrated the vast difference between firearms and cold weapons. Battle of Rourke's Drift Around 4 p.m. on January 22nd, at a place called Rourke's Drift on the banks of the Buffalo River, about six kilometers from the battlefield of Isanlawina, a battle quietly erupted. For thousand Zulu warriors, who had not participated in the Battle of Isanlawina, besieged 130 British soldiers stationed at the crossing point. Among these 130 soldiers, only 80 were regular infantrymen, while the rest were logistical personnel, including 35 wounded and sick. With 4,000 against 130, the Zulus believed they could win through sheer numbers, just like they had earlier that day. However, the British soldiers demonstrated the true power of modern weaponry to them. Instead of launching a reckless attack, the 130 British soldiers relied on the fortified buildings and barricades of the Rourke's Drift Crossing, built with sturdy stone walls, and repelled the 4,000 Zulus with their rifles. The final casualty count saw over 500 Zulus killed, while the British suffered 15 deaths and 12 wounded. After news of the victory at Rourke's Drift reached London, the British royal family generously awarded 11 Victoria crosses to the defenders of Rourke's Drift, creating an unparalleled record in British military history. Following this, the British adopted a steady and methodical approach in their campaigns against the Zulus, denying them any opportunities. On July 4th, the final battle of the Zulu War took place at Ulundi. Once again, a Zulu force of 20,000 men attacked in their traditional Buffalo Horns formation, but this time, they were utterly ineffective. A square formation of 5,000 British troops demolished the determined Zulu assault with firepower. The battle ended in less than 40 minutes. The military structure of the Zulu kingdom was shattered, its capital destroyed, its king exiled, and the Zulu kingdom was effectively no more. The Impact of the Anglo-Zulu War Britain's victory over the Zulus marked the end of the Anglo-Zulu War. The Battle of Isanlawana also became one of the most famous victories in the history of indigenous resistance against colonial powers in South Africa. The courageous and fearless Zulu warriors, with their indomitable spirit, will forever remain in our hearts. They shattered British prejudices with their actions, proving that black individuals could be as brave and fearless as any other warriors. During the Zulu army's resistance against the British, an unexpected event caused quite a stir. In one of their raids, the Zulu forces inadvertently killed Prince Louis, the only son of the former French Emperor Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, who was serving in the British army. This news shocked Europe, as it was said that a Zulu spear had extinguished the Bonaparte dynasty. And that's a wrap for this episode of the video. I'm Dr. Red Panda. If any of you have your own perspectives or if you think there are any errors in the video, feel free to leave a comment in the discussion section. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to subscribe and give it a thumbs up. Until next time, take care.